In today's class, you will learn how to start and grow a laundry service business. Hey, hey, or should I say aloha, aloha, Justin Williams coming to you live from the big island, Hawaii. For those of you who have been following along the podcast know that my family and I just sold our house. In fact, we sold just about everything we own, got rid of it, sold it, gave it away. And we are embarking on a nine month adventure around the world. This is something that we've dreamt about and wanted to do ever since our kids were young and something I've wanted to do my entire life. And we're here, we literally have started. We just got here to the big island a couple days ago. And right now we are at, I'm gonna to totally blow the pronunciation, but it's like Kahulu'u Bay or something like that. But just an amazing place. Uh, my kids and family are out snorkeling. We came here yesterday as well. Amazing fish, an amazing place. We love Hawaii, uh, beautiful people. I would be absolutely remiss if I did not acknowledge and mention those who are in Maui who recently had tragedy hit and suffered from the fires that were there on Maui. Uh, our hearts and prayers go out to them and we wish them well in this time as they are going through this mourning and recovery process. And There's not really words in a time like that, but our thoughts and prayers are with them. We've had the opportunity to go to Maui one time and it was just a beautiful, amazing place. And we wish the Maui people the best at this time and our thoughts and support are with them. So today we are gonna talk about laundry. What's funny, if you hear laundry, you hear a laundry business, most people are like, I don't wanna start a laundry business, but that's exactly the point. Laundry is something that people do not like to do. It takes a long time. I don't like doing laundry, but that's exactly why people will pay to have their laundry done. They'll pay for the convenience of it. And a couple years ago when we moved into the area, I met this amazing person named John Teasley. And just an amazing person. He goes to our church, the nicest guy. Every time I talk to John, he's constantly asking me, Justin, how are you doing? How are your family doing? How's your business going? And I'll go on and on about everything and we'll walk away and be like, oh my gosh. I didn't even like ask him about his family. And he's just one of those guys that just is there to listen and wants genuinely wants to hear about you and your family. And me being someone with the gift of gab, I can sometimes take that for granted. So John's an amazing person. And every once in a while, I do ask him, though, because I love business. I'm very curious about it. One day, I was like, hey, what do you do, John? He's like, oh, I do laundry. I'm like, you do laundry? What? He's like, yeah, I have a business that does laundry, like a laundry service business. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, you own laundromats? He's like, yeah, that's part of it. And I've just been very fascinated. And over the last couple of years, he'll sometimes call and want to pick my brain. But as I have dove in and like asked him questions and heard some of the numbers of what he's doing, my mind has just been blown and my eyes have been open to the possibilities of something like this. Now, as with all of our podcasts, the only goal is not to get everyone to want to go out and start a laundry business, but there will be gold nuggets that you will hear throughout this podcast and any of the classes or episodes that we have here on Millionaire University that will help you with whatever business it is that you are doing. Because really any service or product that you offer in your business, I mean, that's the widget, but you will find fundamentally and foundationally, if that's a word, all business is the same. It's all very similar. It doesn't mean that you have to do everything in every business. But there are a few key things that you'll need to want to do in every business. And you'll find that we talk about that in today's class and past and future episodes. Oh, but actually just about a week ago, I was talking to John. He called, he was listening to the podcast and had some questions. He wanted to hire a salesperson. So I was kind of talking through that, giving him some tips and some thoughts on that. And as I was hearing some more of these numbers and what was going on, I was like, man, if I thought you'd be up to it, I'd have you come on the podcast. And he's like, I'd totally do that. And I'm like, really? So I didn't think he'd be that open to it, but when he said he was open to coming on, I jumped at the opportunity and that's what we have for you today. So without any further ado, let's get to it. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the one and only, the laundry washing king, John Teasley. John, what's going on, man? Hey, Justin, how you doing, man? Thanks for having me on. The most important question before we get started is, I need to know how many loads of laundry do you do per month? 60,000, let's say. <laughs> Whoa, that's insane. 
How did you become the king of laundry, John? Is this something you were born into or something you've aspired to your whole life? So it's been a long, interesting journey. I actually went to school at the University of Arizona, grew up in Arizona, studied accounting, got my first job in San Diego. I wanted to leave the heat. Got a job at Deloitte, one of the big CPA firms. Worked there for a few years, got my CPA license, decided that I really liked finance more than accounting. Went in to work for a, ultimately a, a controller type role and then moved to Becton Dickinson. I think they're like 177 on the Fortune 500 list. Huge company, ultimately was a director of finance for them for quite a few years. I did their financial planning, got involved in helping them buy other companies. And it was a really good experience. Always kind of knew I wanted to be my own boss. I started my side hustle, so to speak, in 2016 and bought my first laundromat. And then in 2019, I got out of the side hustle and said, I'm going all in on this. And I left corporate America, got my second store, and also launched a pickup and delivery service and started serving commercial accounts and, and just went all in on, on laundry. That's awesome, man. So where was the inspiration behind this? You've always wanted to own your own company. You've always wanted to work for yourself. Yeah. Why laundry? What got you into that? One of the factors for me was I was a little hesitant to jump all in being my own boss and giving up a, a very tidy income. <laughs> I saw laundry as an opportunity. It could be a side hustle. I didn't have to be there all of the time. Location where you had a bunch of machines. Yes, you'd have maybe a few employees, but I could spend a relatively small amount of time, still do my day job and start to build that business. So it was a good transition opportunity for me. So you could be doing your day job and the laundry is still cleaning for you. Exactly. So John, you kind of know my story. I dropped out of college with one semester left and I was like, let's go, we're doing this. And then Tara and I went through the school of hard knocks. You took a different path. You wanted to own your own business, but you became an accountant. Then you worked in finance for this other company. And then you went out on your own a little later in years than me when I started my business. What was that like? And what would you say to people out there that are listening that might be a little later in years and are wondering, oh, I have a family, like, is it too late? Can I go out on my own? Like, how did you make that transition work? Speak to us a little more about what that process was like and what you went through during that time. When I think about you and I think about me and kind of our different approaches, I kind of think about swimming lessons. I'm guessing that if I saw little Justin go to the swimming pool when he was a kid, he probably saw the high dive and said, oh, that looks awesome. I want to do that. And he ran up and jumped off the high dive yeah. and maybe halfway down said, oh, crap. <laughs> I don't know how to swim. <laughs> There's no water in here. <laughs> or maybe when you hit the water or, or whatever, <laughs> and it was like, wow. But you knew you had to survive. And so you, you kind of figure it out. And maybe your mom pulled you out of the water. Whereas when I showed up at the swimming pool, I was like, I think I'll go to the shallow end for a little bit <laughs> and play around here. And then maybe I'll go in the big pool, but I'm going to get close to the side and a little more cautious. Right. And so I was a little reluctant to take that plunge out of corporate America and, and sort of the safety or perceived safety there. So it took me a while. And I, I sort of felt like I need maybe a little more financial security. So I took that, tried to put a lot of money away, had some savings. I was like, okay, I'm ready. I like things about my job. I like things about working for a big company, but there are some things that I don't like, like the slowness of making decisions, doing activities that I felt like were not value added, or maybe, hey, if I had this, I'd run it differently. And eventually I was like, okay, those sensations or urges, if you will, got strong enough to where I was like, okay, I've got to do something about this. That kind of led me first to go to the side hustle and, and then ultimately all in on being an entrepreneur. That's awesome. I love that approach because you took action. You didn't have to quit your job or go all in, but you started taking action on it. And then once you were able to save a certain amount or started making a certain amount in your laundry business, then you took that leap. Is that accurate? Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. So when you and I were talking last week, First of all, I didn't think that you would ever agree to be on a podcast. I was kind of joking with you. <laughs> I was teasing you and I was like, hey, you should come on. And you're like, sure. I'm like, really? <laughs> because I remember the first time you and I talked a couple of years ago, 
about your laundry business. You made a comment. I think you were joking, but you're like, don't go try to compete with me now or something <laughs> like that. So I assumed you were joking, but you're open and willing to share this with people, like how you got into this or how they can potentially start a laundry business of their own. Absolutely. Yeah. Happy to share anything I can. Okay, hey, let's do it. What would you tell me or someone out there who would like to try to get started in a business like this? Where do they start? I driven by laundromats. I want to know how to go about, how would you start with that? It kind of depends on the stage of life you're in and your financial situation. I think the, the approach would be different depending on that. I would say that if you have a good chunk of change in savings, thinking back to your episode, which I've learned a lot from your podcast, your episode recently about leverage and the five points of leverage. One of those points of leverage is money and going out and getting a loan and getting investors. But certainly it's easier to attract those if you have some money, some skin in the game. Having some capital to acquire a laundromat here in Southern California, I'd say talking about anywhere from half a million to over a million dollars for a store, depending on the size and location. Other parts of the country, less so. You'd have to figure out how to get the capital. That would be one path, and that would probably be the faster path. There are individuals, they've actually been successful, where they've started differently, where they didn't have a laundromat, and they started a pickup and delivery service. And they went around, and they would either do laundry out of their home, or they would talk to other laundromat owners and say, hey, give me wholesale, wholesale pricing. I'll bring laundry in here. It'll give you more business and be helping me out. And so some people try that and that can be a pathway into the business if you have less access to capital. From a financial standpoint, that's one aspect. Is there like a site that says laundry mats for sale or do you go ask people if they want to sell? How do you figure that out? There is a site. There's several of them. One's called BizBin where small businesses are for sale and you can just filter on laundromats. There's biz buy sell. You can even find laundromats on Craigslist. There's also brokers out there that specialize in the laundry business. And that's probably going to be your best bet, finding a good broker. Sometimes those brokers are also the distributors of the equipment of the washers and dryers. The ones I like the best in my experience are the ones that exclusively do brokerage and they're not also trying to sell equipment. You know, you've got some independent, so they can help in that. So that's how you can go about finding them. As far as learning about the industry, there are podcasts out there, Facebook groups. There's, you know, the, the beauty of today's day and age, you can find any information anywhere. I've heard of people that have obviously bought laundromats, but I'm always telling people there's tons of information on everything, but it just wouldn't occur to me that there is. You live in the laundry world. I don't. One of the podcasts out there is, is called The Laundromat Millionaire. Wow. So it's kind of close to Millionaire. There's the yeah, Laundromat wow. Millionaire podcast. So. We'll have to have them on sometime. So you listen to those podcasts and you go to these groups and you have been learning about laundromat businesses. I do. And there's also a laundry association. It's called the Coin Laundry Association. So there's the podcasts I found, the Laundromat Millionaire and then the uh, Laundry Resource podcasts, I think are the best ones that I've found so far. But uh, yeah. How would you know, like a house, like I know how to evaluate a home. You look at comparables and stuff like that. And you try to find like, can I get a good deal? And then add value. Like, how do you evaluate or know if you're getting a good deal on laundromat? Same idea. Comparables to a certain extent, it's more driven by multiples, EBITDA, earnings before income tax and depreciation. So there's a kind of a standard in the industry. If it's a nicer store with newer equipment, you can get around five, sometimes even six years worth of earned annual income, operating income. If it's older equipment, what they call a zombie mat, you know, dirt, not well, not well taken care of, it's more like three years worth. So anywhere within that spectrum is kind of the rules of thumb. If people want to learn more about the details of this, they can listen to the, that podcast you're talking about, they can do some research online, and they can make sure they're getting a good deal on the laundromat. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely do those things in addition to having somebody you trust who has experience, I wouldn't jump into it alone, right? And that could be a broker, that could be a mentor, somebody or a partner, maybe. Yeah, maybe John, they could reach out to you. <laughs> yeah, possibly. Okay. I'm pretty busy, but I'm happy to help. Happy <laughs> Not to just that, for sure. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> they put up the money and you give them some coaching, you split the profit. That works for you, right? 
People do that. People do that. Yeah. So were you cash flowing this from day one then? Or how did that work? So I guess I didn't go on this. There are sort of two paths, right? You can go out and build from the ground up, either buy the real estate or do long-term lease somewhere. It could be in a, a strip mall. It could be a standalone building. And maybe there was never a laundromat in there before. And then you built, right? You put in all the infrastructure and all that. That path maybe is a little more on the risky side and could be more expensive, could be less expensive. It's a little bit of a longer runway because you're essentially starting a new business, right? And you don't have a customer base. And then the other path is you buy an existing laundromat. They've got customers, hopefully, and they've got a revenue stream and you're buying from somebody else. Okay. So you're buying that revenue stream. It's like buying anything at the revenue stream. You just, how much are you paying for it? What kind of returns are you getting? What's the maintenance going to be like? Do the numbers make sense for you, essentially? Yeah. What synergies can you generate, right? What additional value can you add to that? And I think that's the key. And for you, that has been adding the laundry service. That's been a big component of it. But I don't know last time you were in a laundromat, Justin, but in some cases, it's easier than that. I mean, if you take over a laundromat that hasn't been even just, they're not cleaning it, the equipment's broken down, you can actually be surprised. You go in, you just make a place look nice, do some remodeling, put in some new equipment, have some staff on there to clean the store and greet customers. That can jump your revenue right away and your profitability. But then, yeah, the next step, I think, would be adding more services where people can come in and drop off their laundry or you start up a pickup and delivery service, you build commercial accounts, residential accounts, that sort of thing. Okay, so let's dive into that. What does that look like? How would someone go about doing that? The drop off is, again, these are customers, they're bringing their laundry and then they come and they pick it up. As simple as putting up a sign in your store and saying we offer the service and having somebody there. Because you, you have a physical location, right? So that's yeah. a storefront. You already have, that's like an automatic way of marketing, essentially, if you put yeah. up a sign. Yeah. Okay. Just like any other business. I mean, having a website, people can find you, having search engine optimization, they find you online. And you can do Google ads, Facebook advertising, Instagram, all of those things are going to bring people in you know, to let them know what you offer. That's the same for both the drop off and the pickup and delivery service. So one way is people drop off their laundry themselves. I guess that's better for them. I was like, well, why would you do that when you just put it in yourself? But it's like, well, then you got to put it in. You got to wait for it. It's so much easier to say, here's my laundry. I'll be back later on. Yeah, really, the service of laundry is we're giving people time back. And you're giving them a good chunk of time. If maybe they're at the grocery store, they drop it off, and then they come back the next day and pick it up. They spent five minutes. Whereas laundry is one of the most time-consuming chores there are. You've got to wait for it to go through the washer. Then you've got to put it in the dryer. Then you probably want to be there when it's done. If You don't want your laundry sitting in the dryer for a long time or everything comes out super wrinkled. And then the longest time is the folding <laughs> You take all of that energy out of that, all that time, and you just add hours back to your week. There's a sign. People can drop off, pick up their laundry. But then you guys provide a service. So do you have drivers that do that? You have people that work for you that will go and pick up their laundry? And how does that work? And you said to get those clients, you do just your normal marketing, like Facebook ads or Google search type marketing, or how do you get those clients? Pick up a delivery is the next level of complexity. Then you become more logistics-based business where you've got to have a driver. It's more complicated than a food delivery business because you're just doing one trip. You're taking food to somebody's house and you're done, right? Laundry, you're going and you're picking up their personal items, making sure you don't lose it. <laughs> you're, you're making, it goes to the store, it gets handed off to other people who process it, wash it, dry it, fold it nicely, and then... You can't lose track of it. And then your driver's got to come back the next day and deliver it. And so there's lots of spaces for things to go wrong during that process. So you've got to have a really good system in place to prevent that from happening. Yeah, so that's the logistics side of it. And as far as how you go out and get those, some of the same things. It's having a good website, being when people do search for laundromats or laundry delivery service, you pop up on top. Google Ads, I've found, is the most effective for getting residential customers, you know, families and individuals. It's a little bit different for commercial. I mean, they can find you online, but that's even another level is, is, is commercial accounts. So I was 
pretty surprised. I mean, we met a couple years ago when we first moved here. And I was surprised when I talked to you the other day to know that you only left your job in 2019. You haven't been doing this full time for that long. And when I was talking to you the other day, I think you said it took a little bit to get it going. But the last couple of years, it's really kind of taken off. Is that more or less correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we had some measure of success from the beginning, but not fantastic. But as I've listened to your podcasts, other podcasts about entrepreneurs, that's kind of the way it is. I mean, that's it's actually can be much harder where at first you're working super hard. You feel like you're pushing that card up the hill. It's not moving. You're using every ounce of energy. Nothing's happening. But then you just keep at it and you keep at it and you go through hard times, difficult times, and then the hill gets less steep <laughs> and then you start getting momentum and start picking up and start seeing results. And then eventually you're getting a lot of momentum and it's getting easier to push. And, and that kind of feels that story has held true with me over the last, I would say, a couple of years. We still got to work hard, but it's good to really start seeing the fruits of, of uh, my labor. What does your team look like? How many laundry mats do you have? We just have two, but they're big stores. One 6,500 square feet is probably the biggest in San Diego. The other's 3,500 square. So I got 10,000 square feet of, of space. I've got about 19 employees, about 15 employees, and about four contractors. I'm actually looking at a third store right now, but um, my primary goal is to maximize the existing stores. You know, I've got 24 hours that I can use machine and not have to pay a dollar more of rent. So I'm really trying to grow the pickup and delivery business because you've got a wider area to get more volume in there, you know, improve that profitability. That's awesome. I mean, it makes total sense. I never thought about how many employees you have. You should be teaching me the other day when you were asking me about how to go about hiring a salesperson. <laughs> you sound like you're the one that knows how to hire people. Well, I'm used to hiring laundry attendants, yeah, <laughs> delivery drivers. The sales world is new to me. I mean, most of our customers have come through digital marketing, word of mouth. But now that we're expanding and trying to get more commercial business, it's a little bit of a different beast. So that's where your expertise is. <laughs> <laughs> you manage these guys? You have a manager? What does that look like? I have a manager and I have two sort of store managers. The manager over kind of general manager oversees the entire operation. And then two, I would say, assistant managers slash supervisors who kind of are responsible for each location. Oh, so you're not doing anything. Then. <laughs> well, I do like the flexibility, but I am working hard. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, you're the visionary, right? Getting the people to build the machine and telling them what to build. I think this gets overused, but there's e-myth working on the business versus working in the business. I, I try to work on the business and, you know, I focus on bigger projects. Like we just put in solar at one of our stores. So a big cost saving project. I've worked with my marketing folk and Google ads and Facebook starting to work on getting commercial accounts, more to the sales and marketing type activities. How long have you been doing Google? Because I feel like we talked about that several months ago, but have you been doing that for a long time or? Yeah, we've been doing it for probably a couple of years now, but doing it well, we're, we're <laughs> a shorter period of time and we're continuing to try to improve that. That's awesome. So basically, like you said, I mean, two things come to mind. First of all, I don't think, like you said, the e-myth working on your business versus in your business is overused because I think business is kind of basic. There's a few basic things that if you do and do well, you're going to be successful. So I think it's important to reiterate these things rather than oh, what's the new secret thing? And it's like, no, pretty consistent principles, right? Yeah. The compound effect comes to mind. And we, we talked about that. You took action. And as you continue to take these actions over time, you're starting to see almost like a exponential growth. I don't want to say like insane hockey stick and filthy rich and all this stuff, but you're starting to see some really good results from the efforts that you've put in. They're compounding over time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think I made alluded to it earlier, but I love your podcast on the five leverage points of systems, people, money, tools, 
blanking on the fifth right now, but those have been keys. And at times hard for me for when we started the pickup and delivery, I was doing deliveries for a while. And I was like, okay, I know I shouldn't be doing this, but yes, yeah, it was also, it was like, we didn't have that many accounts and I didn't want to hire a full-time driver. So f- striking that balance and deciding when to bring somebody, start hiring people was a little bit of a challenge, but I've learned now. <laughs> what can someone expect to make? Let's say they have one laundry mat. That's an average size laundry mat, and they get a, the service going. First of all, do you have people working? I guess twenty four seven around the clock. You have like night shift people washing laundry too. At one of my stores, I do. Yeah, you can have what one person doing that, or a couple people doing it. it depends on how much volume you have. It's usually good if you're going to be overnight. If you're not open to the public, we close to the public for self service at eleven yeah, p.m. Yeah. Some people feel uncomfortable if they're by themselves. We have three to four people. Yeah, that's a good idea. But it's like, I think of all this laundry being washed, but I get just rotates, rotate. Oh, and then they're folding too. So that takes a long time as well. How much could someone maybe expect to make? What do the margins look like? What do some of these numbers look like if they were utilizing the service and all that? Break that down a little bit. Generally, an average laundromat, d- decent size, you're looking at about six figures right there around $100,000 a year as you grow and build the pickup and delivery. And again, depending on the size of the stores, it can go up significantly from there. In terms of the margins, the operating income, I think, don't quote me on this, but I think the typical range is going to be 20 to 30%. You know, some people, they got a great operation, you can get up in 35%, I think. And that's not gross profit, that's income, you know, bottom line. Yeah, that's awesome. How do you find employees? How do you train them? What do they get paid? And that is one of the more challenging things in the business because you're working with folks from the retail sector and customer service, and there tends to be a lot of turnover in that part of the job market. We actually, for the laundry industry, we have a pretty low turnover rate, which we're fortunate about. But we do a lot of our research or recruiting through Indeed. Do a little on Craigslist, a little on ZipRecruiter. Indeed's probably our biggest source for recruits at this point. Okay, awesome. Yeah, we've always liked Indeed as well. I haven't used them recently, but Indeed's always been good for us. You mentioned, though, there's a lot of turnover. The one good thing I would say is at least like the training process, I would assume, you're not teaching someone this big, huge, insane thing. Right. It's something that takes a lot of time to do, but not a lot of time to learn, per se. Right. If someone does quit, it's not like you've invested six months into training them how to do all these very complex tasks. Yeah. Our typical training is we give them three days of on-the-job training. Some can pick it up quicker than that. And then if they can't pick it up in three days, it may not be the best fit. What's the plans from here now? Where are you going to go from here? You said you're going to buy another store, anything else in the works? Potentially buying another store, but really my day-to-day focus right now is the B2B side, going out and getting more commercial clients. We serve home health care, assisted living, vacation rental management companies, gyms, salons, just all kinds of industries, but within the San Diego area. So if anyone in San Diego that owns one of those businesses wants their laundry done, they need to reach out to you, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. How could they find you? Our website is freshcleanlaundromat.com. You can contact us through that. My email is john at freshcleanlaundromat.com. So they can shoot me an email. Awesome. And, and the compound effect is you've found what works best for you. You got the laundromat, you got it going, you eventually were able to quit your job. You're building up the services, then you start building up commercial services. And it's like, okay, this is bigger and better than this. This adds more than this. And now your goal is to find a salesperson. Absolutely. Yeah. Get continue to get some of those bigger accounts and just add on big chunks. Like you know who your top five clients are who bring in a big chunk of your revenue, double down on that and triple your business over the next 12 months. Yeah, that'd be awesome. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome, man. (laughs) I love it. Anything else you want to share before we leave with anyone out there who is thinking about starting their own business or wants to keep growing their business? Just any words of inspiration? Yeah, I mean, maybe some of this is kind of an echo of what you said in your podcast, but this is kind of some of the things that have been inspiring to me is I wouldn't say don't give it any thought. You want to give some forethought into what you're doing, but 
take action. Don't be afraid to take action. Just continuously learn. Also, don't over plan and spend a ton of money into starting that business up front. Go out, get the customers on day one and start where you're at and take those first steps. And then you'll kind of be guided and know what to do at each subsequent step. To add to what we were saying, if anyone wants to help John find commercial clients, that's how they can make a little chunk of change too. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll treat you well. Yeah. I love it. This has been awesome, John. It's been really cool to see your journey and talk every once in a while. You're always so gracious. And every time you see me, you're like, how are you doing? How's your family? And as I've learned more about you and what you have going on, it's pretty exciting. Press, I'm going to start calling you and asking you for advice. <laughs> yeah, no, and I appreciate you. I call you for advice fairly regularly. You really are doing a service to folks out there with this podcast. Information that is not available when I was in my 20s. Yeah, I think you're doing great work and excited for your family's adventure over the next nine months. Thanks, man. Look forward to hearing more about it. Well, you're awesome, John. Thanks for coming on and I'll talk to you later. All right, Justin, take it easy. All right, let's give it up for the Laundry King, John Teasley. John is the man. Thank you so much, John, for all the value that you gave. We are all so much better off because of you and your willingness to share with us on today's episode of Millionaire University. All right, guys, well, I am about to hop in the water. Actually, I think we might be leaving pretty soon. We got a night dive tonight with the manta rays, the really big, I think like six foot manta rays. We did the scuba dive about six years ago and I came with my brothers and cousins. And tonight we're gonna do the snorkeling dive or whatever you call it. We're gonna go the, do the snorkeling, the night snorkeling with the manta rays with the family. So that'll be a lot of fun. So we're going to head off and do that. If you like this episode, please share it with a friend. If you have yet to leave us a rating and review, that would mean the world to us. In our next episode, we are actually going to be flipping the script, and we're going to play a recording of an interview that Eric Fisher did with Tara and I on his show, Beyond the Two List. He gave us a copy of that, so we'll be playing that for you. So you'll hear Eric interview Tara and I as we share the top five things that we feel like have helped us be productive and accomplish the things that we've accomplished over the past, our past life, over the past 18 years, 19 years of doing business, running several businesses. So that was fun. That was the first time that we've been interviewed in a while. So we are excited to share that with you. So with that, get out there, keep taking action, take consistent, effective action where it counts, and we will talk to you next time on the Millionaire University Podcast. Class dismissed.